We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would our ambassadors, the ambassadors, um, the coaches that are here with them from Cambridge and from Pearl Cone, if you are here, would you mind just leading us in the pledge? Thank you for what you do. Speaking of which, yes, we have ambas student ambassadors from both Cane Ridge High School and Pearl Cone High School who will be speaking to us today, telling us a little bit about their experience. We cannot wait to hear from them. Uh, so we'll begin with Cane Ridge. Would, you, would your coach, your principal, and our student ambassadors please join us at the podium? Feel free to give them a round of applause as they come. This is a big deal. Hello, my name is Denise King, and I'm the Academy Coach at Cambridge High School, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to three of our ambassadors. My name is Mahreel Faragala, um, and Okay, and so my name is Mahreya Fargala. I am a senior at Cane Ridge High School. My academy is architecture and construction. My pathway is architecture. And I moved to Cane Ridge when I was uh, in my sophomore year of high school. And when I moved into the school, they asked me to pick three pathways. My first one was health, my second one was architecture and construction, and my third one was law. And so, um, and, and so I didn't get the opportunity to be in health academy, so I, um, but I got the opportunity to be in architecture, which has taught me so much that I never knew, personally never knew about anything about architecture, such as the programs that are in architecture field, like uh, Revit and AutoCAD. And so this, this has given me like a, um, a strong feeling about architecture. Um, even though I, um, I wasn't in health, I still did well. Um, in the architecture field, I still tried my best, and I still pushed myself. Uh, which I, being uh, being in the architecture field, gave me the architecture background uh, to have in the future. Which I will tie this into my career, and my career is I want to become a surgeon. As a surgeon, I wish to have my own hospitals, and architecture will be tied into my career by me designing and creating my own hospitals. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Zai Peak. I am in the 10th grade. I'm in the Health Science Academy, and I am in the ther Therapeutic Services. Um, in my class right now, we are talking about how we are, which careers we're going to go into, which pathways and what we need to do in our future to prepare us for what we're going to do. And basically, um, for me, I know that I want to help people out. That's what kind of influenced me to go into the Health Academy is just helping people out, helping animals, just helping out in general. And I think that this is the best pathway for me. One of the careers that I want to do is to be a vet. Anything that helps out with animals, anything that helps them out, anything that can help them in general. Second, I want to be anything that helps with mental health. So mental health disabilities, anything that just helps them out in general. And I just want to be able to be there. And I feel like I've, I'm one of the best people that can do that. Um, lastly, I want to be a surgeon. Just anything that I can dissect, anything just in that, <laughs> in that general um, space. And I just think that um, what we're doing here in health science, in my beginning, I'm just starting. But it, I think it's going to be a great pathway for me to continue on. And I'm excited for what is going to happen in the future. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kamvan, and I'm from Cambridge, and I'm a senior right now. And my academy is art and communication, and my pathway is digital art and design. So the reason why I picked digital art and design is before I choose that, 
academy, I have like a lot of interests like music, fine art, and uh, politics, stuff like that. So I choose digital art and design because out of the four academy that we have, it is like the most appealing to me at that time. So in our design class, we do everything from like basic design principles such as like learning about typefaces, color theory to like Adobe Photoshop, Illustra Illustrator and HTML web design. And pretty much the main idea of learning this thing is that to use uh, our design process and design thinking to like solve problem in the future no matter what field you ended up in. And that to me is a really great deal because even though I, I thought I want to study political science in college, my interest kind of shifted over time like as I get a chance to explore many careers and stuff like that. So I plan to study political science for now. And even though I want to go to a different field from design, I still, I still learn a lot from my academy and I can apply those design process and design thinking to uh, solve problem that I'm gonna face in the future, even though I pick uh, political science or music, no matter what uh, career I ended up in. So, so I definitely love my design class and I don't regret taking it. Thank you. <laughs> Give them one more one more round of applause to Katie. Now, wow. we also have student board members who sit at this table with us, not only to offer their thoughts, but also to offer support to their colleagues who are um, ambassadors or who sit in seats in our schools each day. Would one of you all mind speaking to what you heard? Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say it's very wonderful to see you guys here, and I think that it's great that. Uh, you came in front of the board and you talked about your experiences, which uh, I personally haven't seen before, and it's wonderful. I also think that you guys are being very good role models because you're showing that not only is it possible to have dreams, but it's possible to turn those dreams into goals, which you guys are doing with your uh, selected pathways. And all I could say is keep doing this. Um, if you have friends, tell them to come in front of the board, to, to come when they have those opportunities, to tell us about their experiences. And thank you very much for letting me see this firsthand, too. And, yeah, that's pretty much. Thank you, Ebenezer. He's a junior at MLK, so it's just good to connect our students. And thank you for that, Dr. Battle, for um, supporting this, these connections. All right, now from my neck of the woods, the Firebirds from Pearl Cone High School. If you would not mind uh, meeting us at the podium, just to tell us a bit about yourselves and about a, a bit about your experience at PCHS. Good evening, and thank you for having us. I do bring greetings from Dr. Miriam Harrington, and our thoughts are with her today. Um, also, our other ambassador is not here today because she got a last-minute call for a callback. She's going to college, and she's a dancer, and she says she has to dance, so she does send her regrets. Good evening. Uh, my name is Israel Perez, and I go to Pearl Cone High School, and I'm currently a sophomore. Um, something that it was really drawn me in PCH is their music program. I'm a producer, uh, engineer, songwriter. Um, I, I do it all when it comes to studio. Uh, something we're doing in Mr. Myrie's is I'm, I forgot to mention that I'm in his sophomore and junior class. So um, we learn how to sample in his junior class. Uh, we learn how to sample, uh, mix, mix people's audio, uh, we do it all, <laughs> technically. Everything you hear from music nowadays is technically what we're learning as me being in his junior class, as being a, as far as going as high school. Um, I feel like me doing this, this elective, I, 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 found, I taught myself how to do music, so I find the love and passion for it wherever, wherever I go. Uh, music's been a part of my family for ever. Since I was five, I've been addicted to music. <laughs> um, that, that with Mr. Murray, I I, I want to give him a big shout out because uh, he he helped me with everything I know. But um, uh, that's that's really it. Uh, I also would like to thank my peers at the healthcare 
And uh, thank you guys for letting me come up here and share. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, and we have our senior student board member, if you wouldn't mind recapping. Hi, um, Israel, thank you so much for sharing your story at your school with the board. Um, I know it can be kind of intimidating um, speaking <laughs> in front of a bunch of people, um, but I find it very admirable for um, student leaders to come up and share their story um, through diversity and through their different experiences. And I just wanna highlight how um, MNPS facilitates um, great learning and just the advancement of um, student leadership, student voice, and um, our current passions even before we entered high school. And you just being a sophomore, um, I know that you're going to do great and wonderful things. Um, I thank you again um, for being a leader at your school and paving the way for other student ambassadors and for underclassmen and um, students to come. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. For Thank you, Academy Coaches, for being here, here as well. All right, um, with that, we'll move on to our governance issues. With the consent agenda, do I have any amendments before we call for, okay, we have one. Mrs. Masters. Uh, yes, I move that we pull um, item B4 from the consent agenda for discussion. Okay, any others? All right, do I have a motion to accept as amended? I move approval of the consent agenda as amended. Do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Unanimous. All right, we'll move on to Ms. Masters, 1B4, Country Music Foundation, DBA, Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. So I just wanted to, um, seek some clarification around this one. So I understand that the contract is for um, up to $30,000 with Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum for the Hume Fogg Magnet High School prom. And so I just wanted to um, ask for clarification on the board floor about um, the source of those funds for that event. Sure, Dr. Battle. I have a point of order. Can I make a motion first so we can continue discussion? Um, we can. I move to approve um, consent item before. Second. Okay. Right. Um, sorry. This is no, no. Dr. Battle. Dr. Battle. Thank you. Um, Mason Bellamy is approaching the podium to respond to the question. Good evening, board. Um, traditionally, funds for high school proms are raised by the individual senior classes, and they start doing fundraisers even as early as their freshman year, and they go into those accounts, and the source of funding for those will come from fundraising for that senior class. So am I, is it correct that the reason we are being asked to sign a contract for this is because it, it's above our, the threshold of $25,000? And so, in, so a country music hall of fame and museum is asking that there be a signed contract with MMPS for in this particular case? I, I, I don't want to speak to our rules as far as... Yeah, uh, my name is Scott G, and I'm with the procurement division here at MMPS, and, and I can speak to some of those things. Um, typically, a $21,000 purchase would not need to come to the board for approval. Um, and depending on the risk, um, whether it be risk of, of things happening at the venue, would really determine whether or not a contract is going to be in place. Some of this has to do with um, insurances and things like that. Um, the reason this is coming to you all is because right now it's set at $21,000 with a not to exceed of $30,000. Um, things we've seen in the past from uh, some of these events is some of the changes that would happen pretty close there too um, would cause an increase in the price and we just wanted to be as transparent as possible in case it went above the $25,000 amount. So is, is there any circumstance where MNPS would be liable for any of those funds um, outside of what has been raised by the school? Sure, that, that would not be a, a typical um, thing that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> usually the school knows in advance and so they know how much to charge for tickets, um, fundraising they've done in the past. And so um, we haven't seen a case to where the school is, the, the district is charged for those. So. 
So, I mean, is it correct that this, this is a circumstance that we would, if we were asked to do a contract like this for any of our high schools under these circumstances, we would be willing to do that. This isn't a special situation for a specific high school, anything like no, that. No, no. You'll, you'll see many more of these, um, especially the larger schools. McGavick, for instance, graduate uh, has prom typically at Opryland, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's just starting the, the prom season. So depending on, on the size of the school, depends on if you're going to see more. And, and I would anticipate right. that you'll probably see more as we get closer to that, that time for prom. I believe the four seasons is on here as well. Item number six, I believe, okay. is also one of the yeah. Yeah, we do typically see this as a board, um, like you said, especially for the bigger schools, and especially once we lower the threshold to $25,000, which is why we see so, we, we have to see so many contracts. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to see all those HVAC contracts, too. <laughs> The irony. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. ah. Political joke, political joke. That's a, well, that's actually a good name for an HVAC company. Oh. Okay. Um, thank you. I just, yeah, I really just wanted to offer that clarification around the source of funds and that, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, those are all my questions. Okay. So are we moved to accept it. Thank you, staff, for answering those questions. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh. <laughs> That has really tickled you. All right, uh, it <laughs> passes unanimously. Exactly. We will now move on to our director's report. We did not see you all at the beginning of October because of fall break, so I hope you all enjoyed it. But Safe Schools Week was last week, and we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Battle with her report. Thank you so much, Chair Bugs um, and board members. Um, it is great to see all of you after a few weeks apart, and I too hope that you all experience a restful um, fall break. Um, before I jump into my report, I do also want to acknowledge and welcome um, Ms. Maura Sullivan, um, who has joined MPS as our new Chief Operating Officer. Um, so if you would please stand for just a moment so we can acknowledge you and welcome you to MPS. All right, so first off, I wanted to give a shout out to Hume Fogg volleyball team on their exciting state championship win last Friday against East Hamilton. Let's give them a round of applause. Tell you, it was so great to see so many students and families um, there cheering them on to victory. I enjoyed celebrating um, with Hume Falk's team, Dr. Hargis, um, the staff right after the victory, and then again on Monday um, as they kicked off a celebration on behalf of the volleyball team uh, first thing Monday morning. So again, way to go, Blue Knights. Um, keep them coming and keep up the great work. I also want to shout out all of our great principals at MNPS who are leading their school teams to achieve excellence every day by making sure and ensuring that every MNPS student is known. Our principals do amazing work. It's challenging work, and our community leaders from across the city got a sense of that during Pencils Principal for a Day event last week. So thank you to everyone who came out and participated and supported um, that event. And thank you to all of our principals for um, continuing to shine bright and to showcase all the great work happening across the district. So today, in recognition of School Safety Week, which was last week, as Ms. Bugs mentioned, I wanted to touch base on the topic of school safety and what we do as a district to keep our students and faculty safe. School Safety Week was established in 1984 as a way to ensure that everyone involved in schools, from students to school board members and public safety leaders, um, everyone would advocate for school safety. Without safety, education is severely compromised. To learn, you need to feel safe. Thankfully, here at MEPS, we have zero schools that have been designated unsafe or persistently dangerous as defined by state law. However, we must always be working on improvements to make for an even safer, welcoming learning environment for everyone. There isn't one entity solely responsible for school safety. It takes a great deal of teamwork to put in place the plans, protocols, procedures that help to reduce incidents within our schools and prevent many problems from ever getting off the ground. We have our MPS security team, which works with schools to plan, prepare, and respond. And I'll say more about them in just a moment. 
Our MAPD SROs get to know students and coordinate directly with other law enforcement when necessary. You may remember that our SRO at John Overton High School played a huge role in the response when we had an act of violence on campus last spring. Student support services is heavily involved in our social emotional learning programs and developing other policies and protocols to reduce behavior problems and address conflict before they escalate. Implementing all of those plans and procedures are one our, our school staff, whether it's a principal, a campus supervisor, dean, school counselor, teacher, or paraprofessional, all of our team members, including students, must work collaboratively to keep everyone safe by having a keen eye for potential trouble and addressing it quickly. Everyone plays a role on the school team for safety. Our MPS team does, not, does a lot of important work that most people never see with Metro Nashville Police Department and with school leaders to keep our students, staff, our buildings, and events safe and secure. They assess risk, they plan for emergencies and threats, they provide training and secure or manage grant funding to support all of these efforts. Speaking of teamwork, we know that safety and security isn't just about reducing incidents in the school or classroom, but about making for safer home and living environments. Oftentimes, violent incidents or fights that happen in school start outside of school in students' homes, neighborhoods, and communities. That's why I've been meeting with Chief John Drake, Judge Sheila Calloway, and others to identify some of the programs and policies that are working well, those that can work better, and those that need to be created or overhauled if we're going to come together as a community to prioritize the safety of our youth. I appreciate their partnership, and of course, Chief Drake is an MMPS graduate himself, having come from and graduated from East High School. Safety requires a holistic approach, both to respond to incidents when they occur and also try and stop them from happening in the first place. I'd like to talk about some of our key initiatives to instill restorative practices in our schools that will lead to better outcomes for students and a more constructive learning environment, starting with our advocacy centers. As you'll recall, advocacy centers were one of our social emotional learning strategies that were approved by the board and funded by the mayor <coughs> and Metro Council, along with some additional ESSER funding. So you might be wondering, again, what is an advocacy center? It is a regulation space staffed by a full-time advocacy specialist designed to support social-emotional learning for students, their health, the health of our students, who become dysregulated or stressed and need fast interventions to get back on track in a place where they can learn. It is a proactive approach designed to support the emotions underlying behavior, thereby preventing further escalation and behavior challenges that may otherwise result in a disciplinary infraction. In the advocacy center, students receive help for their emotions through calming, mindfulness-based strategies such as breathing, yoga, movement, connection with highly regulated and caring adults, reflective dialogue, and other calming strategies. While in the advocacy center, students will receive short-term intervention in the form of a reset before returning to the regular classroom. Now last year, we launched the Navigator program throughout the district as a way for school staff to connect with students on issues that may require interventions or additional support. This year, we've expanded that to include student self-reflections through our, our own Sown to Grow program in which students complete a weekly social emotional check-in where they reflect on how they're feeling and set goals. They also receive feedback from their teacher or navigator on their response. And we're gonna get some feedback from um, our student board members um, in just a moment around our Sown to Grow program and our navigators. The first step in the navigator program is matching a student in the school with a navigator, someone responsible for keeping up with the student and monitoring their progress throughout the school year. This year, we have incorporated student check-ins into the process to allow self-reporting of issues that the student may be facing, as well as to get an overall sense of how the individual and the student body as a whole are feeling, be it very happy, very sad, or just doing okay. Teachers and navigators monitor the student responses and can follow up with additional support or interventions as needed. 
Here you can see some of the data that is collected at the district level that shows engagement with students and how they're feeling, as well as responses to alerts at the school or district level if a particular issue is flagged. Another key strategy, strategy here in MPS um, is our youth court. Last year, our zone high schools and selected middle schools were hard at work planning for the launch of youth court. We are so excited to be expanding the youth court programs in Metro National Public Schools. Youth courts operating as peer courts in MPS will offer students charged with breaking school rules the opportunity to take responsibility for their wrongdoing while restoring and strengthening their ties to their community. These courts have roots in the principles of restorative justice, accountability, competency development, and community service. Peer courts hold students accountable for their actions while acknowledging the value the student brings to the school community. In the program, trained student volunteers serve as court members and issue sanctions designed to help their classmates chart a new direction. Meaningful community service is a part of every sanction. In the MMPS program, goals include decreasing school rule-breaking incidents, decreasing exclusionary discipline, meaning suspensions and expulsions, and decreasing um, discipline disparities, with an emphasis on a reduction for African-American students in alignment to our focused outcomes. Now, youth court is youth and family focus, youth driven and built on the principles of restorative justice. Restorative principles of justice look at an infraction as a poor decision that caused injury. It is the hearing's objective to help the defendant or the respondent make amends to the injured persons. Part of our core tenet of empowering and equipping leaders at all levels includes empowering and equipping students. And youth court is a great way to do that by helping students make better decisions, improve their conflict resolution skills, and expanding critical thinking abilities. Participants can gain a better understanding of their rights and responsibilities under the law while developing empathy through an understanding that bad decisions don't necessarily mean bad people. Redemption and second chances are critical if we want to stop the cycle of violence and, and, um, and keeping our communities and society from progressing to where we should be. Now, I'll wrap up this presentation uh, with a quick look at a few other strategies that we use to increase social-emotional learning and safety. That includes strategic investments in restorative practice and close reviews of school culture and climate. We are constantly working to ensure that our students, staff, families, and facilities are safe and secure and that violence doesn't have a chance or a reason to get started in our schools. Now, at this time, I want to take um, just a moment um, to um, allow our student board members to share a little bit of their experiences, um, particular to our Navigator program and our Song to Grow um, initiative. So I'll turn it over to our student board members, and they're going to just share some on the ground uh, reflections of their realities uh, within their respective schools. Ebenezer. Uh, uh, actually, I, I'd love to talk about the Navigator program and the Song to Grow because it's something that I was surprised with when I first experienced it, especially with the Navigator. When I first joined high school, they signed me a Navigator, and he's been with me throughout my high school career. And he's always been someone not that not only can I turn to for academic pur purposes, but also for personal purposes. So during the pandemic, he would send me texts saying, oh, you know, are you okay? It's okay to talk to me. Um, and he makes it easily approachable. And the fact that I've been with him for a long period of time strengths that relationship and it's been something that's been supporting me throughout my high school career. And then this year with the Sewn to Grow, um, I think that the fact that it's an online-based or a pro, uh, yeah, online-based system makes it much easier for students to actually express how they're feeling. Because sometimes uh, as a teen student, you coming up to a teacher and telling him that you're feeling sad might seem uh, kind of difficult and it might make you apprehensive. But some, when you're texting or when you're on your phone and you're just typing it out, it feels like you're just and put in simple terms, you're just venting, and that makes it very easy to express your feelings. And uh, every week you can see your progress in the program, which allows you to see yourself develop. And the fact that teachers can respond to your programs or to, your, um, uh, to the things that you write. For example, when school first started, I was having 
you know, difficulties with how my grades were affecting me. So my teacher sent me down, he saw my progress, and he was like, well, sometimes it's okay to not let your grades always affect you. And that's been something that's been helping me a lot, and I know it's been helping a lot of my friends. So I just wanted to uh, commend this program and also the Navigator program that we've been exercising in the district. You know. Um, so specifically to the Navigator program, I know that this took um, place on emphasis of last year during the pandemic when we were all virtual and students didn't really have that much support that they do in the classroom with their teachers. Um, I was actually lucky enough to have my Navigator be a former teacher of mine at my school. Um, and I understand that for Hillwood, um, most students received a teacher that they had a class with or that they already were um, introduced to so that that relationship was already established and I really appreciated that. Um, with Stone to Grow, I do want to build up on what Abnezer said. Um, sometimes now that we're in person, it's kind of um, uncomfortable or um, difficult to talk to a teacher regarding your feelings, especially um, emotional well-being, face-to-face. Um, -face. But um, with Stone to Grow, um, when certain things are picked up, then teachers can reach out to the students if needed. And I really commend that. Um, it's a way for students with um, a really good mental health as of right now to express their feelings, but also for those who aren't doing quite as well um, to get the help that they need. Um, I also wanted to add for Hillwood, we have a weekly check-in that's specific for grades, and that kind of separates from Stone to Grow being mainly emotional well-being and a check-in while um, this check-in that we do for Hillwood that may look different for other schools kind of focuses on academics purely and that could tie in to how a student might feel emotionally and how they're doing in class. Thank you, young people. Thank you so much, uh, both of you sharing your personal experiences um, in the space, particularly around navigators and um, sound to grow. Um, thank you also for just being willing to, to share and to speak in front of the board and um, the audience um, who's with us today. Um, always appreciate your perspective and your voices around um, things that are working well and areas that we can to continue to focus in on. Um, so uh, Chair Bugs, that wraps up my director's report and I'll turn it back over to you. Wonderful, I mean, thank you very much, Dr. Battle for these updates on everything happening in the district to protect our students and staff and help create a safer community. I really, really appreciate that you're elevating the idea that keeping schools safe is beyond just keeping them safe physically. It's the emotional, uh, the emotional and social supports. Uh, community school, I mean, um, schools are where community issues really do bubble up. And so it, it's all of our job, you know, I mean, Every little bit helps. It's not just about keeping weapons off of campuses. Um, again, I'm grateful to Dr. T Dr. Battle and her team, to my fellow board members, and even to the Mayor Cooper and the Metro Council for the decision to invest in those advocacy centers that we talked about for a few years. And they're across the district, so it's not just in one concentrated area. We're not excluding anyone. We're just starting with our youngest, our littlest babies, our elementary school students, and then growing that. Because safety, like I said, is not just the job of one person. It's not just the principal. It's not the SRO. Safety is all of our responsibility. We've seen teachers, support staff members, even students. We had a student who was a little too shy to give his name, but a student step up in very tense situations where they stop fights, where they simply let the right person know that a gun, a weapon, or that something has happened on campus. Our school's teams do extraordinary work every single day. They are feeding our babies, they are taking our babies to school, they are educating them academically, socially and emotionally. Um, and we just really, really appreciate that because learning can't happen when students would be, if students are scared, just like learning can't happen if students have not been fed. And so you're making sure that their well-being is thought of. And if I may speak for the entire board, I know we are extremely grateful for all of these principals, assistant principals, school counselors, psychologists, teachers, parapros, bus drivers, cafeteria staff, and every single support staff member that, that makes this happen every day, that does this intentional, critical work for our babies, for our babies, not just yours, not just mine, but ours. I mean, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, schools are where community issues bubble up, so let's be mindful that it does not start or stop in a school building, on a bus, even in the cafeteria or on the field. We're also grateful, as you said, to Judge Callaway, Chief Drake, and everyone else in the community who works with our young people to create a safer community, again, outside of our schools. 
So thank you all. Thank you all so much for maintaining the, the welfare and the health of our littlest citizens, our babies. With that, I'll open up the floor for any questions for Dr. Battle. We have uh, Mrs. Player Peters, Mrs. Tyler, and I believe Mrs. Masters and Mrs. Elrod, and then Mr. Little. Everybody join in. <laughs> <laughs> this is a request. It was more of a comment that, um, especially hearing our two school board members speak, but the skill that we're teaching our, our students now how to advocate for themselves, particularly emotional, that's gonna play a bigger part in their careers as they go into the workforce, the way the workforce is changing and how um, a lot of corporations and nonprofits are looking at the whole employee and how their emotional health affects their doing their job. And I think this is a safe way to start doing that so as they become adults, it's not a whole new skill set. And I think that's something we don't always think about when it comes to education. It's not always the academic, but also the life skills that's learned and be able to find that um, navigator or that person to talk to about your emotional health. And like, you know, you're talking about your grades. I mean, that's a common thing that goes on from college to grad school, um, even now as my as adult, making performance metrics and anxiety that you may get the performance metrics. I even had a discussion with my own boss about my anxiety not meeting the metrics by the end of the calendar year and how that came into um, a, a discussion for the whole organization about how do we approach that to make sure we succeed. So um, I just want to commend Dr. Battle and the staff of even looking at it for, from a holistic standpoint of really teaching our children and our, not children, our students um, and our young adults about really the life skills it takes to be a successful leader because it's not all about the technical knowledge, but it's also the emotional leadership that you have to provide once you become leaders. That it's not just becoming what you know, how you know. When you lead people, it's how you do it emotionally because you're dealing with the whole human. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for that, Ms. Player, Player Peters. Ms. Tyler. I just had a couple of questions um, about different things. So starting with the advocacy centers, I just wanted to double check and be clear on the funding. Are the coaches for every advocacy center going to be paid through student-based budgeting moving forward into the future, or is that something that the district's going to pay for from central office? Um, so our current, our first phase of advocacy coaches um, were funded through ESSER yes. funds, mm -hmm. um, and I believe that number was 14. Um, our second phase um, of getting, um, hitting our goal of having an advocacy coach in every school um, came through our operating budget. And so that will be a part of our student-based budget moving forward, and then we'll strategically be planning around the 14 that are originally um, approved through our ESSER funding. Okay. Um, and then if we're using school-based budgeting, then um, is there, like, is every school required to have one? Or full-time, part-time, how does that work? Um, every school is required to have an advocacy center staffed by an advocacy coach or specialist, but we do have a few schools who have um, different programming that meets the standards of um, advocacy coaches. So if you uh, recall, we have a few schools who have Be Well um, in their schools. Um, that is the same um, concept, idea around the supports that we need for our students. So those are approvable and will be covered under the funding um, for those coaches to be inside the schools. Great. Okay. Um, and then looking towards our middle and high school students, um, do we have a restorative justice specialist in every middle and high school? We currently do not have a restorative practice um, coach in every middle and high school. Our goal um, is to have one in every um, school. In fact, a part of our ESSER um, budget um, was to um, expand um, in meeting our goal and getting a restorative practice um, coach in every school. So that is our goal. Many of our schools do already have one, uh, but our, our ultimate district goal is to have one represented in every school and then also looking at the size of school to make sure we're meeting the needs. Um, and if our goal is to have every school have one, are we at some point gonna have a requirement where you say, I know that the principal gets to choose what you do with student-based budgeting, but you have to at least have one restorative justice specialist, or is it still gonna be completely up to the principal? Um, so the position and the space will be required in every school once we get to the funding level that we need to be in. Um, the training, most of the training happens at the district level, uh, but we work collaboratively with the principal and the student services team on selection of the coaches for the schools. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then looking at the Navigator program, um, I just wanted to... I just I want to take a second and point out that the Navigator program has always been meant to be a teacher and a student and not necessarily reaching out to the parents. Um, so I 
I know that my elementary school students last spring Last year, I was contacted by navigators as the parent because they're elementary school. But my middle school child, he was contacted by him, like by the teacher directly to him. And I think there's kind of been a little bit of a misconception about that the navigators are supposed to be reaching out to everybody's house and to everybody's parent. And so if we could just kind of maybe just get somebody to clear that up and give a little bit of a, this is exactly what it's supposed to do so that we understand what the what the expectation is and, and um, how it's being met. Um, so um, every student that goes to have every student assigned to a navigator, here's the point of clarity here with the navigators. When we were, and I think Angelie um, actually spoke to this extremely well, when we were in the virtual space, um, parents, um, likely felt and heard the conversations frequently because students were at home. And that was happening um, through Teams meetings, through phone calls, maybe even a visit um, from a navigator. Now that all students are back in person, that's happening for the majority of the time during the school day. Um, so for instance, Angelique mentioned hers happening during advisory. Um, and so it looks, it might look a little different in every school because every school has different structures and schedules um, to accommodate that. Um, but it will feel a little bit different in the in-person environment Environment as opposed to being virtual because those contexts, for the most part, um, are happening during the school day with the student. And so that is a shift um, that we did make. It was critically important when we were learning um, all virtually in the pandemic at home that we were making those home connections. Uh, but now that all students are back in person, um, nine times out of 10, that connection is gonna happen during the school day with the student. Now we always promote um, family engagement and parents being involved, so we do still encourage uh, parent contact communications updates um, as needed. In fact, if you are not aware, our Parent Teacher Conference Day is happening on Friday. Um, so if you've not yet um, connected with um, teachers for updates, progress and supports needed, um, Friday is um, a great day to do that. Um, I encourage all families um, to be connected in their process and we'll continue to encourage our staff um, to connect with as many families as possible to make sure those updates, those connections um, and supports are in place for every MMPS student. Great, um, I, I appreciate that because I was, you know, at last year I was wondering why I'm not hearing from my middle school, but I am, but my elementary, and it's just really important for the public to understand what the parameters of the program are so that we know what to expect as parents um, and as community members. Um, looking at the, the Sown to Grow um, program where we're talking about um, letting students kind of do these check-ins. Can a student refer a friend that they know are struggling so a teacher can reach out? Is that? Um, yes, I can. I'm going to invite um, Carrie Randolph to the podium to speak a little bit um, about the capacity of, of Sown to Grow, um, students connecting with teachers, sharing information, um, assessing how they're feeling, so on and so forth. Well, I, mean, I think Evan Nizar and Angelique did a great job. Um, so it, and they can probably speak to this too. So there's an emoji and a student chooses an emoji based on how they're feeling during that check-in. And then there's an open response box. A student can, there's a prompt, but a student can essentially write anything they want in that prompt. And we have seen, um, we have instances where what you've just described has happened. And um, based on that, um, if there's something concerning um, that's reported through that box, an alert is sent to the school team, the admin team to follow up on. So we have seen cases of exactly what you've described where it maybe isn't a student saying something about them, but a concern about a fellow student or another concern in the school have been reported that way. And I think they did a great job of describing like, it is a space where there's some safe, there's a safe space to share those kinds of things. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. I just, I, I really like these programs where our students have a chance to feel heard and seen and they feel safe so that they can say the things that are actually bothering them and, and have those concerns be addressed. Um, like Chairwoman Bug said, you cannot learn if you do not feel safe and you, we must make sure that our students feel safe. Um, so I'm now looking at our youth court. Does every middle and high school have an active youth court? Um, not yet. Okay. Uh, we are expanding on the youth court um, structure. Again, it started in our high schools. I think all of our high schools now are youth court um, schools and have been trained. Now we're expanding into our middle schools. Okay, great. And um, so 
I guess eventually everybody will have it. So it's not that the school decides whether or not they want it. Eventually we're hoping that everybody will have this. Is that correct? We are, you can consider this, consider this a piloting space in the middle school um, area. It has been successful thus far. Um, it's a, um, a good um, pride booster for kids and them representing their school and working with their peers. So you, I would consider it a pilot space for middle school. Um, we've historically had this program and we've had some versions of it in, in middle school, but um, in, in our high schools, we started with our high schools that had law academies um, and then quickly learned that with or without the law academy, um, it's a good structure that's in place, student voice, um, student accountability and responsibility. So uh, we're, we're again uh, now for the first time really dipping into the middle school space. We're going to learn and hopefully grow um, into all of our middle schools if all things go well and it continues to support our students' needs. Great. Um, how are our students that are going to be on the court chosen? Um, I'm going to invite um, Dr. Michelle Springer up to the podium to talk about that specific process. Thank you for your question. Um, for our students who are interested, there is an application process, um, and actually it's uh, pretty rigorous. Um, so if you um, are selected and you, uh, you wanted to be there, so, um, you know, it's about leadership. It's not about a student who gets it right every single day. Um, and it's about um, the ability to uh, influence your peers in a positive way. So um, again, it's just an interview process, um, really uh, looking at those students who are interested um, in leadership and, and elevating voice. Um, and those students are selected. And it's a pretty big deal. Right, to be able to select it and serve in that role, um, to be before your peers um, and make those decisions collaboratively to make sure that the school culture um, is uh, inclusive, um, equitable, um, and supportive. And, and if I might add, just um, being a previous principal who um, had youth court on campus, you know, sometimes it's hard to impress our young people. Um, <laughs> they, they have very high expectations and are dreaming. Uh, but it was a really big deal for um, my high school students to apply for, um, be selected as, and be trained um, as a part of youth court. Um, in fact, um, on uh, any, any day, um, just being on campus, you could identify <laughs> a youth court um, leader because of their uh, pledge to lead. Um, and to follow school rules and to support their peers in doing the same. So it's a pretty big deal, um, pretty big honor for um, our students who are selected to participate. Oh, I'm sure it is. Um, and then the last thing, just looking at the flow chart for the, the school-based youth process, um, it looks like the administrator is the one who gets to decide whether or not the issue goes to youth court, or is, is that correct, or are there ever any times where it's just automatically triggered, we know this is going to youth court, or does it always have to flow through administration? I mean, there's a standard. We know which codes um, work through this process, um, but sometimes you might find a situation that's not you know, normal, um, not a trend that the principal might have to have some discretion around if it goes through youth court. Um, again, this is a very um, confidential process, a very restorative process, so we want to be mindful um, of, of that, particularly uh, in putting those instances before their peers. Um, so th there is a um, already pre-selected set of codes that we know will go through, but if there's something unique or different that we need to assess, it goes through the principal. All right. Um I think I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what Ms. Player Peters said. Just it's so important that we are addressing the well roundedness of our students. Um, there have been so many studies about when you are learning how to self regulate and when you understand how to understand what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. It makes you not just your better self, but it makes you a better community member. It makes you a better friend. It makes you um, just somebody that people can trust and know that they can count on. And I think it's, we're in the business of more than just filling people's heads with facts. We want to make sure that we're creating and helping to shape students that will have positive impact in the community moving forward. And we cannot do that if we do not address social and emotional learning. So that is such a key important strategy. Um, always, always Maslow's before blooms. You cannot learn anything if your brain is in a, a state of flight or fight. 
you have to be able to feel safe before you can get down to the business of learning. So I just want to applaud that these are what we're starting. I want to encourage that we continue, that we check up, that we ensure that they're doing what, what we intend for them to do and that our students feel like it's actually happening and that they're being heard and that they feel safe. So just kind of those continuous check-ins to make sure that everybody in every school feels like they're getting the same equitable treatment. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Mrs. Masters. All right, Mrs. Uh, Elrod. Thank you. Uh, first, Abigail wins for saying Maslow because I was wondering who was going to say it. So, yeah. <laughs> I was like, who's going to bring it up? All right, so um, my first question is a follow up question um, in response to Board Member Tyler. Um, with the restorative practice assistance, the schools that do not currently have those assistance, is it because we're not able to fund those or is it because we're not able to find someone to fill those positions? More than likely, it's an alignment to their school improvement plan and they've prioritized their investments in the priorities that they have. It's not that it's not a need, um, but they might have additional other priorities that they want to make sure they're investing in to meet the needs of their students first. Okay. so. And I understand that the answer was is that they are required within the school-based budget. Um, so even though they are required through that school-based budget, it is possible that they are not prioritized? So the restorative practice assistants are not required in the secondary level because we've not been able to fund them at a level okay. um, at, of a non-negotiable. Uh, we do recognize it as a strong restorative practice um, for our secondary schools. Um, so we have um, provided the supports and the means necessary for schools who um, have this area as a priority to be able to hire restorative practice assistants in advance um, of the additional funding for it to be um, visible in every MMPS school. That, that is my mistake for writing down are required instead of are not required. I appreciate that clarification. Um, additionally, with the youth court opportunities as a follow-up, they are not in all middle schools currently. It, do we have a timeline of when we would like them to be in all middle schools? Um, this year, um, our goal was to get to pilot into the middle school space. This is a new space for us for the youth court um, programs, you know, and um, it's kind of a hard question to ask the director because it, everything would have been like right. yesterday. Um, but, but hopefully moving into um, next school year, um, if we have the resources available and the capacity to support, we would love to continue to expand across all of our middle schools. I understand it's a difficult, like on the spot, it's more of a... Um, an ideal world. What are we trying to go for? What are we trying to shoot for? Um, okay, back now to my, my individual questions. Um, for our security and SROs, do we have, let me write my, have my little notes. Do, are any of those positions um, provided additional training in security or SROs over students that are neurodiverse that may not that may struggle with emotional or behavioral regulation. Um, yes, um, we have expanded our um, training for our school security team and our SROs um, to address some of the most recent trends we've seen around social emotional learning, uh, meeting the unique um, um, and diverse needs of our students, um, de-escalation, um, implicit bias. Those are all um, trainings that we've um, started to make available to um, our security teams and in collaboration with um, MMPD. Um, so those conversations um, are definitely in play and I'm looking out to see, um, Edie Young, anything you would add to that? Um, back in August, uh, we received invisible disability training from, in collaboration from uh, student services. And so that's one of the other areas that we've been taking in. So did M the SROs as well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for adding that one. Thank you, I know that's been a request in the past from families. Um, so I appreciate that specific date as well. Um, so sorry, I'm looking through all of my notes. I should have made a star. Um, advocacy centers, we've heard, I've heard a lot of really good feedback on the training and the training that's provided there. Frankly, the feedback that I received is that it would be really helpful. It would have been helpful to me um, to have had that in my para position. 
or my other position that I've had inside of the school. Is there availability for us to expand this training since it has been so beneficial through, it has such benefits as we have all commented on, but outside of the advocacy center and it's just frankly seemingly a best practice. Do we have opportunities to expand it? Well, I think this is um, a benefit to um, uh, feedback um, and engagement because we've heard the same thing um, internally. And so that's something that um, our team is reflecting on and making determinations around um, how to expand access um, for, for the training. But consistently we receive positive feedback around the advocacy coach training and the supports that are in place. So um, Dr. Springer has that on her radar um, and we'll continue to look at how we can leverage that particular training to um, other support staff and certificated employees. Because I understand it's a multiple day, like at least a four day training, is that correct? Correct. So I, I didn't know how we would be able to replicate that, but if we can find a way to implement some of those best practices or where we're hearing the most impact, I think it's, it's obviously a valuable at resource because I've heard it from multiple levels within our schools of how it would have, how it's helpful now, which is of course important, but how it would have been so impactful in other ways as well and how they're sharing that already intuitively with their past colleagues. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, I had brought up and I appreciate the conversations about us, um, including inside of our student parent handbook about secure firearm info. And I understand that that will, um, hopefully be included maybe in next year's uh, parent teacher handbook. As we've all discussed, um, you know, the threat of any type of violence is out of our schools is the responsibility of all adults. And it's a community concern and issue as we have discussed with um, our great partners and Judge Calloway and Chief Drake. Um, and so my hope is that we will continue to have additional resources provided inside of our parent teacher handbook as an index potentially for parents so that they can have access of how to keep, um, all kinds of things, whether it's medication to secure firearms, um, a way in, uh, not available to their minor students um, so that there's not potential gun violence and there's less access to them. Um, so I appreciate that those conversations have been happening and that there's been support for it. That's what I have. All right, Mr. Little. Thank you. Uh, and just looking back in the notes, my question is what's the ultimate goal of the Navigator program? Um, so um, if we recall back to the um, start of the pandemic, um, this is where the Navigators um, um, initiative came um, about. Um, the intention was to make sure that our, um, every MPS student had a caring adult um, that they were connected to, um, that they had someone who would advocate for them and help them navigate <laughs> uh, what they were experiencing um, at, at the time. The whole idea here and the goal here is for students to have that ongoing consistent support um, from that caring adult who knows that student as an individual individual, and, and then um, thus can personalize um, those supports um, that are needed for them to be successful. Um, that Those supports um, should range from the social emotional learning space to the academic needs um, of, of our students. Thank you, thank you. And, and as how are we collecting data on the success as the students connect with their navigator? Like, and, and what I mean, it, are we collecting data where we can potentially see trends, both good and things that we may need to work on that we're seeing a, a lot of students experience? Absolutely. Uh, we are very data driven. I'm looking over to Michelle Carey. Do one of you want to um, respond to the what we've seen in trends for the collaborative referral process, but also the feedback that we're um, seeing in Santagra? Sure. I mean, we uh, certainly have talked about how that safe space for students and that every student known, cared for, respected, and supported in those connections. But we, um, one of the other that's the most powerful piece, right? But the one of the other powerful pieces is the data that we can see, um, both school leaders can see, right? But we can see at the district level. And so, for example, last year with check-ins, we could we 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 do and still monitor the number of collaborative referrals that are generated, right, from check-ins. We also kept track of needs, and we actually responded in real time. It was one of the pieces of data that we used to. Um, work with the virtual help centers as an example last year, right? So we do use that data around decision making. Um, same thing here, and Anjali um, added, so Hillwood is um, got an advance. They're, they have, um, we have different modules within Sonda Grow, and so the academic goal setting, Hillwood is piloting 
um, right now. And so when she mentioned that, we are also, as we have the needs and have identified them, we're adding in different components. So we don't just have a dashboard at Hillwood, for example, around social emotional. Um, and there's a happiness meter, for lack of a better word, but also um, across the district at the school level, we can look at it by cluster. We can look at lots of different things by grade level. Um, but we can also see the number of alerts that are generated, what those are focused on, right? So at the district level, it does, I mean, we're the support hub, right? So how are we leveraging resources to support the needs that are coming from the schools? And the power of this data is, from Stone to Grow, it's straight from the student. And from Navigator, it is from the adults who are working with those students every day and, and cataloging their needs. Thank you. And, and, and I ask that because this is a huge initiative. So I, I text my son. I was like, how are you feeling? And give me an emoji. And he gave me the happy. Um, but one thing that I know from my son and I know working in schools that kids really don't communicate. So one of the things that I see, like the navigator is included in the multi-tiered systems of support, which I think is awesome. What, what I'm getting to, how do we have how do we create a relationship between the navigator and the student, but also transitions to the parent? And, and I'm sorry for this analogy, but like what I loved about Phil Jackson at the Lakers and the Bulls, he had the triangle offense. And so you think about school, you think about community, and you think about home where kids spend a lot of time. And, and right now, if you have a teenager, you know they're, they're not really going deep into what's going on. And I think a connection with the home, the mom or the dad and or the dad can say, hey, just want to give you an FYI of what's going on at home. And so you don't have a disconnect of really helping a student that's dealing with social emotional issues. And my question is, is there any way we can incorporate, because this is a whole program, the, the parent into the program? Because that, Abigail beat me to it, and I'm glad she said it. One, she broke down Maslow, but two, like she talked about, I, I remember you hearing those calls at home, and now we don't hear them, and so that was going to be my question. And so I appreciate her for getting ahead of it. But then it's like what I see is a, is a missed opportunity to connect all the dots, especially as we deal with middle school and high school kids. Is there a plan? I guess my question, is there a plan to incorporate parents into this triangle? Here, you can approach, and I'll um, share this if in, in my explanation earlier. This is not absent the parent. This is why we also have parent-teacher conferences. All those parent communications should still be happening. This is not replacing um, that, that phone call home or that conference with a student sitting right beside you um, that, in particular, at the beginning of the year, tell us a little bit more about your student, your aspirations um, for your child. This is an additional um, piece of information, feedback directly from our students to help inform and advise. Um, that's a space that we were challenged in um, earlier, having a um, system-wide strategy to make sure all students had access to sharing um, what they were feeling, what their needs were for us to move forward. I could also take 30 minutes and tie back into where we're going with our personalized student dashboard, um, but just know that those connections are being built as well. But Carrie, talk about kind of our long-term vision here. Sure, we've been with Sewn to Grow in particular, that is designed to be a safe space for the student. Um, but we have, we are, we have provided resources and encouraged navigators, for example, to, to, use, to allow a student to use a student-led conference protocol in sharing their stone to grow with their navigator. We've not explicitly, um, to be honest, done that with parents, but that protocol is out there. And, and we think um, to the earlier point about self-reflection and like a student being able to look through their data and talk about what was happening with them over time is a really, a really strong adult skill building strategy. So, um, but that is a safe space for that student. Um, but there, the tool is there um, in order, but it would be um, currently, because the Stone to Grow is a student facing platform, it's designed for students. Um, and we were intentional about that as being part of what we were looking for, but there is the ability for a student to share that with their family or caregiver, absolutely. Well, and, and I also wanna not uh, forget to highlight POSIP. Um, uh, we do send POSSIP checks out to families, to parents and guardians biweekly. That's right. Um, so that we can gauge parent feedback um, as well. So this is what you're seeing on the student end. 
the families also receive that um, pretty user-friendly text um, on a bi-weekly basis so that we can gauge uh, where the, the student um, is, um, if there's any family needs, so that we can be responsive to. Thank you. And then my, my last question, as we look at some of this, the disparities within our communities, like when you look at ACT rates, you see them high in one place and very low in the other. So as we look at the data, how is the Navigator program going in some of the schools that are high performing academically? And then how is the Navigator program going in some areas that are low performing academically? And are you guys tracking it or is there even a difference? Dr. Battle? Here it's gonna, thank you. So uh, the expectation is that all students have a Navigator as Dr. Battle shared. So um, we do monitor that and provide support at the school level. Um, when you look at trends, I don't, we don't see the trend maybe that you've just described where certain schools, I mean, it really is, um, it, it, it varies as to engagement, but we push in to support um, and, and keep that expectation high, right? That every student has a navigator, but we don't, we don't find that there is a trend that some schools have implemented more deeply or things like that than other schools if that's your question. And, and we continue to push and provide weekly updates to executive directors around the data that's coming from their schools so that they can provide support. So it's no connection with a school's effective rate on the Navigator program based on the zip code or how high or low achieving? We haven't seen those trends. And to be clear, we did GIS mapping of Navigator check-ins, like a heat map, and okay. we didn't see that that was necessarily a trend. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I'm done. Any other questions or thoughts? All right, go ahead, Ms. Tyler. Yeah, I, can I just kind of shift gears a little bit to talk, to ask a little bit more about the, um, the advocacy centers? and using uh, restorative justice in our middle and high schools. Um, I um, had a meeting with NOAA where we were discussing, uh, you know, following along with making sure that our students' needs are being met in a way that is sensitive to their families and to their culture and making sure that they're being heard in a way that, that they feel heard. Um, so I just kind of was wondering, you said that we are very data-driven on these and that we're tracking things. Are you able to share like all, what, what's the data that we're capturing? Are we capturing how many students are being referred overall or are we capturing individual students? They're being referred X number of times within this period of time. Are we capturing the data of who are the teachers that are doing the most reporting? What, what are we actually looking at? We actually have the ability to pull all of the above. I mean, for one specific example is when we talk about um, the tremendous increase that we've seen in collaborative referrals to our students, which means we're aligning supports to the needs of the students as we're determining them um, on a daily basis. We can break the data down to, to, to see 200 students were referred to a social worker today, right? And so now 200 students, where are those students? Right. Have they been referred in the past? Are these new uh, referrals? Have they been connected? Who are they being connected to? I mean, we can we can drill down to, to, to that degree when we're identifying um, trends. We have the ability to see um, who um, is um, entering Navigator data and which referrals um, they're making. Um, so we have the ability to slice it in, in many different ways as we're looking at district um, level data and drilling down. Okay, great. That's really important. I think, like you said, it's important to be data-driven, to understand, you know, is the same student being referred a ton, but only by one teacher? And so maybe there's a personality conflict. Or is um, the same student being referred repeatedly by a, a vast amount of teachers for the same issues, and they're not seeming to understand? So how do we better support them if this isn't working? Um, or, you know, is one teacher kind of driving most of the referrals and do we need to talk to that teacher about how can we better support you? It seems like you're really struggling with these kids. Um, so I think it's really important to have that data so that we can look at it. I think it would be a great thing to kind of include that when we're looking at parent-teacher conferences, when we're looking at teacher-principal conferences, when we're kind of taking the time to self-reflect on how do I use this program. Um, my only concern is that if we're looking at the data, I don't want us to be afraid to refer somebody because it might look, you know, I don't want that to 
Yeah, and, and I'm glad you, you brought yeah. I'm glad you brought this up because with um, navigators and song to grow, referral is a good thing. Yes. Right. Yes. This is a, this is a positive. Mm -hmm. A referral is not for disciplinary infractions. It's not for any um, exclusionary practices. This is all about referring students for support. So we want mm -hmm. as many of those referrals as we can get as uh, um, needs are identified. Um, so there is no punitive measure um, to this if a if a uh, parent um, or excuse me a navigator suggests that we have an S team that we bring the parents in and we meet with the, 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 the family and the students to make sure we have a strong plan in place. That is a positive. That is something we're going to celebrate because we've identified a need or an opportunity um, to really um, elevate um, the outcomes of, of our students. So um, the good news here is that when we see um, uh, maybe an uptick in the need uh, for students who um, need more uh, wraparound services for food, right? That's a positive. We now know where to target um, our, our next partnership or our next food delivery because we've seen an increase in a particular area. Um, so th this is a very uh, positive data-driven process based upon where our needs are. And Carrie said it best, we're a support hub. So what we do is then shift our resources um, to make sure we're meeting the needs as referred by our adults, our employees, and our students. Um, and, and, and we're very proud to have our students' voice be a part of this process because it's, you know, you're able to balance out uh, where the true needs are. So if there was a miss in some way, uh, we also have had an opportunity to hear from the student. And on the other end, because of our POSSA pulse checks, we're able to hear from our parents as well. Great. I just I think it's really important that and I love that you you reiterated that it is a positive thing. We are looking to help one another. We are not looking to be punitive. That is important. That's the whole basis of restorative justice. Um, so that's that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the data. Um, how frequently are we going to be checking in on it? Are we is it like going to be a once a year check? Are we going to be doing once a semester? What's, do we have a plan yet? <laughs> the data that we receive from Song to Grow we and Navigators? Getting, yeah, when we start getting oh, the data from because he's sent daily? Us those things. <laughs> That's a daily process that we're okay. checking in um, on um, the data and what we're seeing um, as far as supports needed. Now, don't get me wrong, when, when these needs are identified, on the schools are immediately responding. They're getting the flags, they know their students, they're responding. Our responsibility is to also look at the data to make sure they have what they need to be able to provide immediately um, to the students that, that are being served. So it's really directing those conversations, um, those resources when we're looking at our equity matrix or making determinations about investments we need to make. We're pulling that data um, so that we can make sure we're targeting um, those resources and investments in the right area. Okay. And then I guess for the longitudinal eye of like what does it look like for this school? What does it look like for this grade level? Is that something that will be checked yearly? I mean, I'm just trying to think of how are we assessing how well we're supporting everybody, teachers, parents, students, the whole nine yards. Yeah, that, that will be ongoing. Uh, we we launched Song to Grow two months ago, I believe it was. So we're still like learning its capacity. Um, we're still giving feedback to them about what will be most useful um, for us. And so I think that's to be determined, but of, but most definitely uh, we want to look at in the long term how um, such a um, platform has allowed us to respond to the needs of our students. And as a result, we've been able to improve the outcomes. Right. And then um, will that data be available to us, to the public? How is it, will it be accessible? Yeah, that's, and that's what we're working with Song to Grown on is just being able to, what data do we need? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what data do we want and to communicate without, back? you know, right. compromising, right. Right. For, you know, without compromising students' yeah. identities and all that. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to overstep those boundaries, but I do and, think it's important for the public to be able to see trends over time. Well, and as an example on um, slide 13, um, that was a part of my director's report. Um, you can see um, engaged schools, um, what's considered engaged teachers, students, um, the reflections that have been written back. So that means that when a student goes in and shares something, an adult responds um, to the student and the student can see that um, and their feedback, uh, the feedback given and the number of alerts received. So in a transparent way, this is already a, a snapshot of what we're seeing, but also protecting um, the confidentiality um, in the space of our students. So this is just one example of uh, what we can um, pull and kind of a, a meter of um, the pulse check on where students are right now. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Good question. Right, thank you. Time.
thank you all for this. Um, I could, I always have an anecdote about my experience with my neighborhood school and how often Ms. Pringle and Dr. Taylor reach out to me. I know everything happening at doggone school, but one thing that I really appreciate is that my baby had a three out of 10 stars for the first like three weeks. He has been consistently between seven and eight stars in behavior and I'm so proud. Today, I was asking him, you know, how was school? What did you do? And after about three responses, he said, I would like to stop talking. <laughs> and even though I was frustrated, I remember we've been talking about consent and we've been talking about ways for him to help to regulate and set boundaries. And that baby set a boundary with me that I had to respect today. He didn't really learn it from me. He actually got that from Ms. Pringle at Jones for Day. You know, and I only knew that because Ms. Pringle sent that out in her weekly newsletter. And so I just, I, I of course want to shout out Jones, but I appreciate this kind of intentional, secular, you know, work, that, collaborative work that our schools and our parents and our students are doing. But if that baby tells me that I would like to stop talking one more time, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try to respect it. So thank you for helping our babies self-regulate. <laughs> With that, we'll move on to announcements. Uh, we'll begin on this end with our senior. Anjali, would you have any announcements for the week? Um, yes, I do. Um, I'm reading a message from um, my advisor with the Mayor's Youth Council. Um, so the Mayor's Youth Summit is coming up and it's an annual opportunity for youth to lead conversations around issues that are important to them. They will share their ideas, experiences, concerns, and recommendations to Mayor John Cooper and other key city stakeholders like you. On Wednesday, November 3rd, over 150 Nashville High School students will come together via Zoom to discuss community issues and help us foster initiatives that build a better Nashville for all youth. Um, so we would really appreciate if you could join us. You can register at bit.ly slash myc myc 2021 or click the link in my Instagram bio at my first and last name, Angelique Kimbo. And for my seniors, the November 1st deadline is less than a week away. Make sure to turn in your college applications. Um, and as always, good luck. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hale. Uh, um, Mrs. Tyler. Um, a quick shout out today's uh, school spotlight is in District 9, Harpeth Valley Elementary. So just go hound dogs. I used to teach there. I went to school there. I love that place. So shout out to them. Um, and then just a reminder that Friday, there's no school. It's parent teacher conference day. If you have not heard, you need to reach out to your school. Some schools aren't doing their conferences differently. I know in my district, HG Hill is offering it different hours to better suit our parent needs. So if you're not sure about how to access a parent teacher conference, reach out to your school's principal. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Mrs. Masters. I have a few. Um, so I just wanted to um, to say that we so we did not have a PAC town hall this evening. The planning was just sort of um, difficult with fall break, but we will have another parent advisory council town hall on November twenty third at four p.m. Um, so everyone, mark your calendars. I um, also wanted to mention that the Insurance Trust met on October 6th, and they continue to do amazing work in serving our employees. Um, we once again have received American Heart Association Target BP Gold Award um, and the American Heart Association Workplace Health Achievement Gold Award. Um, and th this is just for the really high standards that we have in doing the right sort of outreach and interventions with employees. Um, we also won the Cigna Wellbeing Award. So the awards just keep coming in for how well we serve um, our employees. We also have um, been having uh, flu shot clinics. It is flu shot season. Um, I heard from my pediatrician last week that she had not seen any flu yet. So it hasn't started yet, but it will. So get your flu shots. Um, the last open one for MMPS is in the Wellness Center this Thursday from 9 to noon. But after that, you can go to the, to the Kroger in the Wellness Center. You can, I mean, you can still get the shots. It's just not like a big open thing. So get your flu shot. Um, also wanted to give a shout out to Pencil for another great Principal for a Day event. I was very honored on October the 21st um, to serve as principal for a day at Hunters Lane High School. Although I was very clear that 
if I really tried to be principal for a day and take Sue Kessler's place, I probably wouldn't survive it because <laughs> she's a superhero. So what that really meant was that I, I joined them via Zoom for a little while and learned a lot of things, which was fantastic. Um, but Pencil, as always, um, just put on a, a really a spectacular event. I'm just so grateful for all, all of the good work that they do um, to help support us in Metro Nashville Public Schools. Um, I think that is all. I also want to mention that I got to visit an advocacy center in one of the elementary schools. Um, and speaking of the referrals, I was really excited that the, um, the lead in the advocacy center at this elementary school is someone who'd been a part of the school population for quite a while, knows the students, knows the teachers. And um, even as the teachers were sort of trying to figure out, well, I mean, should I refer? What's going on here? He just kind of was, was going around the school. And if he saw a kid that was a little out of sorts, he, he was just pulling them on in to do like some yoga and deep breathing. And it smelled really good in there. There were lots of essential oils. Um, and the, you know, the ceiling tiles were painted like clouds and it was dim lighting. And I almost just stayed and took a nap. So um, it was nice. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Masters. Mrs. Player Peters. Um, I like to echo Sue Clesser's being a superhero. Uh, there was a story that happened. Dr. Bellamy was there at graduation. Her reflexes are like phenomenal that she actually caught a student before they fell. So <laughs> Sue Clesser is a superhero, yes. literally. <laughs> um, also, um, I would like to, I mean, you took my thunder about the flu shots. So get your flu shot um, if you can. And that's wrapping up with the wellness clinic um, in the next week or two. And then also, um, I talked to Fabian Benet from the mayor's office and to remind students, um, if you're 14 years and older, you can participate in the, in the uh, participatory budget process, particularly if you live in North Nashville. Um, the process started in October, goes all the way into December. Um, so students can actively be part of that civic process of where your tax dollar goes to. It's allocated $2 million. So I encourage students to all participate in that if you're 14 years or older and you live in North Nashville about how you can direct some of the taxpayer fund, funds goes to. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. Um, John Overton's pack or the Overton cluster pack, they're going to be hosting um, a viewing of by design on Saturday, um, November 20th at Emerson Pike Library from two to four. Showing is going to be at two discussions around 334 ish. Um, so you are welcome to come to that, whether you are within the Overton cluster or not, but it's an available, um, you know, afternoon or weekend option for you. Uh, additionally, speaking on pencil, uh, we had principal for a day last week, and I appreciate the community's involvement. It continues to be really beneficial to have those conversations and build community involvement and partnerships. Um, they also just let me know today that um, they have a partnership with Lysol and a pallet of, pa of wipes is coming to every MMPS building, it sounds like. Yeah. So it's like 180,000 packs of wipes, which that's a lot of wipes and we need them. Um, this is about that time of year when your back to school wipes that you sent in are starting to kind of dwindle down as runny noses happen and allergies happen. And so I appreciate that participation with pencil as well. And then lastly, I wanna thank um, the mayor's office for their recent uh, funding that they provided for us on some projects. Um, and uh, personally, I am very excited about Haywood um, having their design fees be uh, funded and so it's a very exciting time for Haywood and of course the South Nashville Elementary School. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Elrod. Mr. Little. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, participated in principal for a day with Stanford Montessori, which really made my heart smile. Hate that it was virtual, but it was still good. Um, another TSU homecoming is this week. So for all my alum, we say geek geek. Christian and I were featured in a Tennessee and Arc. I don't know if you saw it, Christian, but just highlighted our homecoming experience. We had a parent advisory council meeting last week for the McGavitt cluster. Um, thank you to Dr. McKinney and the uh, eight to 12 parents who were on that. We talked about the personalized student dashboard and, and really got a chance to give get good parent feedback for the McGavitt cluster. I'm hosting an in-person parent meeting for the McGavitt cluster coming up in the next two weeks. We're still trying to figure out based on the interest, um, the space we need. So I'll send out more details for that. 
Um, big news, Propel, Nashville Propel is hosting a town hall tomorrow at 530 at Merrill Hyde um, in Hendersonville. In the last two or three weeks, it's really come about that the governor is trying to restructure student funding. Um, and so Nashville Propel will be co-hosting, asking really good questions um, before they move forward with this initiative. Um, shout out to Ms. Callahan for allowing me to dig deep with our middle school students. And so when we were talking about um, this seed to sow that really was important to me hearing from a lot of middle school boys. Um, and so really looking, Abigail asked some really good questions that I had. And then last but not least, my 20 year class reunion with Stratford High is this Friday. So pretty pumped up, once a Spartan, <laughs> always a Spartan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ebenezer. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating all the everybody that took the PSAT today, especially the juniors, because this year does count for the National Merit uh, Scholarship Program. And I would also like to point out that it's time for us juniors to start thinking about these standardized tests like the ACT and the SAT. So it's all my fellow juniors to, you know, start getting in that mindset. And then I want to finish off by congratulating again Hume Fogg for their um, state volleyball championship. They are my, you know, arch rivals because I'm from MLK, but in the end, <laughs> it's still a win for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a reminder, redistricting is happening right now through the Planning Commission. There is still time for you to not only review the maps for both the school board and the council, but also for you to offer feedback. So tomorrow at the Bordeaux Library from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock by appointment only, you can uh, schedule a time to go review the, the maps and then offer your feedback. But anyone can come between 4.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. So again, that's tomorrow at the Bordeaux Library between 2 and 7 p.m., but open house is from 4.30 to 7. Um, you can also drop by the planning department's offices at the Metro Office Building uh, out there on 2nd Avenue, either, um, I'm sorry, next Thursday, or I'm sorry, this Thursday from three o'clock to six o'clock. Now, I believe you can still email redistricting at national.gov if you're not able to make any of these, just to offer your feedback. If you go to redistrict.nashville.gov, again, that's redistrict.nashville.gov, you can pull up the, um, the maps for both the school, the proposed maps for the school board and the council. There have been some stark changes in some districts. In fact, I completely lose East Nashville in this, in this version, which means I lose about 12 schools and then push further into to North Nashville. That's my personal district, but many of us are seeing some changes like that, so feel free to, to, to review those. Also, Hume Fogg uh, Magnet, not only are these athletic young people, but these are artistically gifted young people as they will be putting on High School Musical from November 4th through 2nd at 7 p.m. They really do a great job at these musicals, at these productions, so please feel free to, to um, visit the Hume Fogg website to purchase tickets for November 4th through the 6th, their High School Musical. And then I'll ha we have one more, uh, two more, one from Ms. Tyler and one from Ms. Masters. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot two, two announcements. One, um, there will be a community meeting at Hillwood High School on Thursday, November 4th yes, from six to seven um, to get community input on naming the new high school. So we have uh, the initial survey. I'll share some of those results at that in-person meeting and then I will be soliciting advice and ideas from the people who attend. So please mark your calendar, show up to that. And then I just wanted to cheer because um, Dr. Hildreth posted that a key FDA advisory committee today recommended a lower dose of Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine for children ages five to 11. So I'm extremely excited that my children, that y'all's children, that our kids that are in school are gonna have the opportunity to get the best preventative measure very soon. And I want to encourage all of our parents to have their students and their children vaccinated um, as soon as it's officially approved. Thank you, Ms. Masters. I, I just didn't want to fail to mention that um, th also the Educators Cooperative has another fantastic event coming up this Saturday. It's another one of their anti-racist teaching panels. Um, it is free, it is open to all. Um, uh, teachers are encouraged to attend, um, and you can find information about that at educatorscooperative.org. All right. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Be there now for the business. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Go ahead.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.